Wow. <laughs> What's going on, Comic-Con? Man, I can't tell you how pumped I am to be here today with all you guys, with this panel. This is a dream come true for me. Uh, so what's everybody's name? <laughs> okay, got it, all right, good to meet you. Uh, my name's Jay Ferguson, I am, uh, oh thanks, hey mom. Uh, I, am, uh, <laughs> I am a, a lifelong uh, sci-fi slash all things space related nerd, geek, fanboy, bordering on the obsessive at times, which I feel like a couple of you in this room might know what I'm talking about. Uh, <laughs> quick story, uh, I was around 33 and my wife and I were about to be married and we woke up one morning and we were having coffee and she said to me, you know, Jay, I've been really tolerant, I've been really patient, but I just cannot wake up one more morning opening my eyes to Darth Vader looking down on me from your framed Empire Strikes Back poster on your wall. <laughs> Conversely, there was a Star Wars poster on all of my walls. Uh, but now I'm 40, and the Star Wars posters aren't on my walls anymore, but they are on my sons. And I am proudly raising three little nerds. Took them to Star Wars Celebration a little while back. It's pretty awesome. Uh, you know, the beginning of my love of, of, of space and, and sci-fi really started with Star Wars. Um, that was kind of the fantastical side of it, and then it, then it hit on a real side for me when I saw the right stuff. And that became kind of the catalyst for me to uh, follow my dream of becoming an astronaut. So I, I started to do all of the things I thought I needed to do to do that. I went to space camp when I was 16. Uh, for those of you that went to space camp, I went to Aviation Challenge as well. Uh, great time out there, incredible experience. Uh, followed that up, going to the Air Force Academy in uh, Colorado Springs, had every intention of going there. All right. And uh, then I took flying lessons, got about two flying lessons in, and uh, it became quickly apparent to me that I was going to have a hard time piloting a shuttle or any other spacecraft if uh, I couldn't stop throwing up. So uh, th those dreams were dashed, um, but I was afforded this incredible opportunity to become a mediocre actor and uh, excel at that. Um, but this topic is really incredible. You know, turning uh, science fiction to science reality is, is, is a real deal now. I mean, you know, you think about uh, the guy making the video phone call to his daughter on her birthday in 2001, and you think about the comlinks in Star Trek, and then you look at this, you know. Uh, but those are just toys. You know, you got Lexus coming out with the hoverboard. Unbelievable, right? But these are all just fun things. I mean, I think that, that Really, I believe, uh, and it might seem a little bit silly, but you know, to me, the uh, survival of mankind depends upon what these people on this panel are doing with their life's calling. And it is, yeah. And it is absolutely imperent, imperative, excuse me, that, uh, you know, we continue to raise awareness for the space program, we continue to raise awareness for space travel. It depends heavily upon public opinion and public support, and without it, it is, makes their job a lot harder. So continue to spread the word. Now, uh, why don't we get started, huh? <clears throat> so first thing we're going to do, man, this is so cool. <laughs> uh, I don't know about you guys, I watched every single piece of the International Space Station built live on NASA TV from my computer. My wife would walk in and wonder if I had lost my mind. Uh, so it is my absolute pleasure to introduce uh, a little video greeting from the International Space Station. And this is uh, featuring Scott Kelly who is currently on the station on a year trip. He's about a hundred and some odd days into it, I believe. Uh, so let's roll it. I'm 
I'm astronaut Scott Kelly of NASA aboard the International Space Station. I'm flying at a speed of 5 miles a second, 250 miles above the Earth, aboard this magnificent laboratory where every day we turn science fiction into science fact. It can't be a space adventure without robots, like the droids in Star Wars were testing robotic devices to help perform autonomous satellite servicing in the future and other selected tasks normally reserved for astronauts to conduct during spacewalks. And very much like in the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey, the space station is a destination for commercial companies to deliver cargo and in the not too distant future astronauts as well. As I conduct research during my one year mission on the station, the lessons learned will pave the way for our journey to Mars. Let's uh, meet our panel, shall we? Uh, to my left here, we have Amber Strawn. She is an astrophysicist. Now, let me tell you something. I don't get starstruck easily by like actors or musicians, but you put an astrophysicist in front of me and I become like a giddy fifth grader, okay? Uh, she's from uh, NASA Goddard uh, Space Flight Center. Goddard was the name of my team at uh, Space Camp, by the way. Uh, Amber works on uh, subjects ranging uh, from the James Webb Telescope to exoplanets. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what's going on, Amber? Sure, well there's a lot going on. Um, as an astrophysicist, I use the Hubble Space Telescope and telescopes on the ground to study how stars and black holes form in distant galaxies, which is pretty much an incredible job, so it's a lot of fun. And I also work, um, as Jay said, on the, the James Webb Space Telescope that we're building right now, and we're launching in 2018. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, that's very exciting. Uh, next we have Kevin Ham Hand, excuse me, Kevin. Deputy Chief Scientist for Solar System Exploration from JPL. Kevin's an astrobiologist and planetary scientist and a National Geographic Explorer. Stop showing off already. <laughs> Kev, why don't you tell us a little bit about what's going on, buddy? Uh, well, my focus is on what I like to call the ocean worlds of the outer solar system, these moons that have liquid water beneath their icy shells. And these are worlds where I think we might be able to go in the coming decades, and actually find living life, life that is alive today, that we can poke and prod at and see if life has originated a second time in our own backyard. So we'll talk more about that. Yeah, that's exciting. Uh, hello. Hello, sir. That guy's name is Adam Nimoy. And um, he is a producer and the son of space royalty, Leonard Nimoy. Adam, why don't you say hello? Hi, my name is Adam Nimoy. Uh, I'm really happy to be here I, um, and share the stage with such a, a, a distinguished panel. I'm here to talk a little bit about uh, For the Love of Spock, a documentary I am now writing and directing based on uh, the life of Mr. Spock and the life and legacy of Leonard Nimoy, the man who brought Spock to life. And, uh, uh, we'll be talking a little bit more detail about that later, but I'm um, really happy to be here, and, and I, the, you know, the turnout is phenomenal. So <laughs> yeah, thank you all incredible. for coming out. All right, cool. Finally, we have Adithya Sood, who is the producer of a movie I think we're all excited about, The Martian. Woo! <clears throat> coming up soon from 20th Century Fox, starring Matt Damon, the man. Why don't, uh, why don't you drop a little uh, fun little thing on us right now, huh? <laughs> uh, well, apparently, and I didn't know this until the beginning of this panel, I'm also responsible for, what was it, the future of humanity? That's right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, no pressure. No, is what, sorry? no pressure. No pr <laughs> well, I'm really excited to be here and uh, really, really excited about um, The Martian which uh, you know, was a, a, a book that uh, Andy Weir wrote that uh, I found when it was still a uh, self-published book on, on uh, Amazon. And here we are two and a half years later, and thanks to uh, you know, a lot of great people uh, at NASA, uh, we are about to, uh, to uh, show to the world uh, on October, October 2nd. 
Um, in fact, we actually have a little something I'd like to show you guys, if you're interested. Ah, huh? come on, let's see it, baby. Every human being has a basic instinct to help each other out. If a hiker gets lost in the mountains, people coordinate a search. If an earthquake levels the city, people all over the world send emergency supplies. This instinct is found in every culture, without exception. At around 4.30 a.m., our satellites detected a storm approaching the Ares 3 mission site on Mars. The storm had escalated to severe, and we had no choice but to abort the mission. But during the evacuation, astronaut Mark Watney was killed. I'm entering this log for the record. This is Mark Watney, and I'm still alive, obviously. I have no way to contact NASA or my crewmates. But even if I could, it would take four years for another manned mission to reach me. And I'm in a hab designed to last 31 days. So, in the face of overwhelming odds, I'm left with only one option. I'm gonna have to science the shit out of this. Okay, let's do the math. I gotta figure out how to grow four years worth of food here on a planet where nothing grows. But if I can't figure out a way to make contact with NASA, none of this matters anyway. Houston, be advised. We've got a video message. It's directed to the whole crew. Play it. Mein Gott. <laughs> Mark Watney's still alive. Woo! In your face, Neil Armstrong. We left him behind. Let's go get our boy. This is something NASA rejected. So we're talking mutiny. And if we mess up the supply rendezvous, you die. If we mess up the Earth gravity assist, we die. It's space. It doesn't cooperate. I guarantee you that at some point, everything's going to go south on you. And you're going to say, this is it. This is how I end. Is it possible that he's still alive? That guy really has it all, doesn't he? He's the bad guy in Interstellar. He's the good guy in The Martian. I mean, good Lord. <laughs> well, that looks incredible. Really excited. Um, all right, let's get started with our first part here. Uh, really just talking about the relationship between space science and science fiction. Um, really throughout NASA's history, uh, it's been inspired by science fiction, and it's converse, conversely influenced it. Uh, so I guess I'll pose it to you guys first. Uh, Amber, you can, you can go first. You know, how, how were you directly influenced by pop culture, and sci-fi, and all, everything under the sun there? Yeah, I, I definitely was. I think pop culture, science fiction, um, all along the way has had a big influence on me. I mean. Yeah, movies like that, Star Trek, the whole thing. It's just, yeah, it's awesome. I also, um, I grew up in rural Arkansas on a farm, middle of nowhere, and so the beauty of the universe itself has also been a big inspiration to me uh, from the time I was a little kid. Um, but I think, I don't know, I think that the, the way that NASA and science fiction sort of mutually influence each, each other is um, is really cool. It's a really fun thing that, that uh, that happens, and I don't really think it's surprising. You know, I think both of these realms, science fiction and NASA, 
they sort of strive for great things. You know, they're all about imagining a better future, imagining things that is just barely beyond our reach of what we can do now. And I think that's why that they're they're so related and they influence each other and, and why so many of us find those common interests of science and science fiction. Hmm. Kev, what about you, buddy? Um, similar influences, yeah, I wanted to be Elliot and E.T. Uh, mm -hmm. Grew up in Vermont and was always looking for that spaceship in the, uh, in the woods. Sadly, it never came. Um, would you not be here anymore if <laughs> it had? Yeah, but think about where I would be. <laughs> um, but uh, that, that sort of life cycle of, of science fiction feeding into science fact and then uh, that, that continuous loop is so important. And just watching um, uh, Aditha's great uh, uh, video here, it, it makes me think of how long Mars has been in our sort of social consciousness. And I'd like to sort of put forth a, a challenge to this community, such a, a creative community, that there are other worlds that really kind of need your help to get embedded into the, the social framework. These are worlds like Jupiter's moon Europa, Saturn's moon Enceladus. These are not moons where we're necessarily gonna put astronauts down on the surface, although I did help out with the Europa report, which I, I think did a really nice job with that. Uh, you know, we're gonna be sending robots there. And our ability as NASA to send robots to these worlds is greatly helped by the degree to which the public identifies with and gets the, the profound scientific potential and, and imagination of, of new worlds and new life forms that could exist. So please, you know, don't just think about Mars, think about all these other fascinating worlds out there in our solar system. Mm, amen. Uh, also, I wanna echo that because we need a sequel to The Martian. <laughs> hey, Matt Damon, Matt Damon on Europa, or, or Kristen Wiig, that would be hilarious. <laughs> Aditya, I'm, I'll throw it down to you. Uh, what, what, what do you think in the film and TV world, how, how NASA and the space program's been a, a heavy inspiration? Well, I, you know, I can just sort of speak personally. I'm, I, you know, I'm, I think, roughly the same age as you, Jay, and I, I kind of came, came of age, you know, definitely on, on Star Wars and definitely on... Uh, Actually, my, my personal guilty pleasure is uh, 2010, the year we made contact. <laughs> That's okay. Don't go to Europa. Europa love. <laughs> yeah. Attempt no landings there. Yeah. Oh, but we must. <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> um, but, you know, equally important for me, actually, the, the, my first real sort of memories or, or, you know, the first time I really thought about space was a, a little program called 3 to 1 Contact, which, uh, you know, I remember at the time, it was just, just when Voyager 2 was, going by, uh, was doing its um, flyby of Saturn. Mm -hmm. And I remember that just capturing my imagination in, in such a profound way. And I also remember on a school field trip, I think in kindergarten, uh, listening on an AM radio to the landing of the first space shuttle mission, uh, the Columbia. But, and by the way, AM radio is what we used to use <laughs> to learn things before the internet, but after the telegraph. <laughs> Adam, let's take it to you. Uh, what, what, what do you think the, the reason is that your, your dad and Star Trek touched so many people and inspired a number of NASA scientists, astronauts, engineers to, to pursue careers in their fields? Well, uh, there's been a lot of commentary from scientists about how they were inspired by Star Trek. Uh, it kind of, it, it does go hand in hand because there was a lot of space program going on in the 60s when Star Trek came around. Uh, one of the things that we've heard, you know, I've been doing a lot of interviewing for this film, for the love of Spock, and talking to a lot of people about Star Trek and really kind of getting into the milieu of, of what people are thinking and why it resonates, Star Trek resonates so much. And one of the things um, that people have commented on repeatedly is the fact that Star Trek takes place in the 23rd century and, and the word is good, the, you know, the future is good, which was particularly interesting for the time period in which Star Trek uh, was first uh, premiered because we're dealing with the 60s where there's all this social unrest and uh, there's, uh, the Cold War is still kind of uh, permeating uh, society. Um, there's um, there's uh, anti-war demonstration going on. So in the midst of all that kind of turmoil of the 60s, this positive message that people can come together from all different backgrounds, races and nationalities, including 
you know, a gentleman who happens to be half alien and work together for one common goal, which is space exploration and the good of mankind, is something that has, I think, inspired a lot of people. Uh, that just is, a, you know, yeah, I think. <clears throat> That general message that Gene Roddenberry was trying to portray, which is that the future is good, it's gonna be good, uh, was a great inspiration to people. But the other thing that is so interesting about um, Star Trek is that it really inspired a lot of creativity in the scientific community. There's so much technology in Star Trek. A lot of it just by invented by necessity uh, for the show to function um, that uh, has come into reality. And we're talking about communicators looking like well, the old cell phone, you know, the flip, yeah, the flip phone phones, that we yeah. used to have, right? We're already past the communicator now. Um, but uh, the, the whole idea of uh, the personal computer, I mean, there's computers all over, all, you know, on board the Starship Enterprise, which they interact with on a daily basis, which was not, there were no personal computers back then. So that was something that was a challenge that inspired people. Um, the, the whole idea of, um, of space exploration, uh, you know, warp drive, we, we, we haven't quite gotten the, you know, uh, traveling faster than the speed of light, you know, quite under our, our belts yet. This idea of warping space so we can get from one end of the galaxy to another within that one hour time frame of network TV. Uh, you know, I mean, apparently the galaxy, I just learned this from Neil deGrasse Tyson, the galaxy is 100,000 light years in diameter, right? Okay, so it would take a while from get to one end from, to the other. So. Uh, there are all these, t and, and then the whole thing about beaming down the planet's surface is something that has also inspired people to try to figure out a way to strive for these things. We, we, we don't have the phys physics for it yet, necessarily, but, but these are all things that have kind of driven the imagination of the scientific and technological community mm -hmm. to, to make into reality things that we were just dreaming about back in the 60s. That's great. Can I just add something? Yeah, please. They, uh, you were talking about the various devices, and it reminded me, one of the mythical things that we would love to create in the astrobiology community that evades us is the tricorder. Uh, you know, we, we have meetings about what payload, what instruments could help us definitively say whether or not we have found life. And we don't have the magical tricorder yet. We have various instruments can, that can triangulate on the question. But uh, Boy, I would love to have that little thing that just tells me, oh, this is based on this kind of compound and such and such, this is the biochemistry. <laughs> We're not there yet, but it's the tricorder is referenced constantly in the astrobiology world because we want one. We're getting close. Some of the rovers, those, those, some of those instruments on the rovers, they're doing a, a smaller version <laughs> yeah, of that. Yeah. Right. And one other thing. Go, oh, please. Uh, you know, you touched on creativity, and I think a lot of times when people think of science, they think of, you know, cut and dry sort of cold facts. Uh, and sort of separate it from creativity. But there is so much creativity that is required to do all these awesome things that NASA does, you know, rovers on Mars and, and sending people to Mars in the future and building these huge telescopes uh, that we send out into space. Amazing amounts of creativity that are required to make these things reality. Absolutely, I mean, you, you know, we would never go anywhere if anybody right. didn't have a creativity. Uh, okay. Uh, Adithya, you talked a little bit about uh, how you found the book and, and optioned it, uh, but did, uh, maybe you wanted to touch a little bit about uh, you know, how you had to work so closely with NASA, and they, yeah. and they were there day after day on the set, right, I imagine? They, they, uh, NASA was, it turns out, very excited about movies that make NASA look awesome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and deservedly so, because NASA is awesome. I just want to be, you know. Uh, they uh, they really just rolled out the red carpet for us, and uh, you know Jim Green and his whole team you know answered every question that we could possibly have about you know how would this thing you know really work, um, and and I think that's one of the really for me one of the really wonderful things about The Martian um, is is and it started from Andy's book you know is really the commitment to um, to reality you know I, I think there's. You know, science fiction is great, and I, I love science fiction that far, you know goes very far afield from what our you know day-to-day -day experience is. But there is so much drama in what actually exists, and I think that this is a rare opportunity for us to make a movie that really takes advantage of that. And mm -hmm. and I think NASA, um, you know, every you know every every person that we've talked to, I think it's it's something that they've echoed to us too. That you know. We want, we want people to actually get a feeling of what it's gonna be like to go to Mars. 
And I mean, we, we kind of got a hint of it from the trailer, but what, what, what would you say is the, uh, the, the bigger human message that the Martian wants to deliver to the masses? You know, it's a really interesting thing. I, I think one of the wonderful, one of the other wonderful things about The Martian, it, it actually reminded me a lot of, um, I don't know if you guys ever read the book, Watership Down. You know, mm -hmm. it, the, that, it's a book, that book's about rabbits, right, on an adventure. But I think everybody who read that book and was touched by that book found their own sort of message and their own sort of meaning in it. And I actually think The Martian kind of did a similar thing I, for me. And I, I knew, you know, I, I read the book overnight, and it's one of the things that we do in this business is you, 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 you want to read for pleasure, but sometimes you just have to read things really quickly um, because you know, other people are, are also reading at the same time and chasing the same things. But I, I read the book, we, and, and Fox optioned it. And that weekend, I gave it to my wife. And I will tell you, you could not pay my wife enough money to read a science fiction book. Like, it's just it's not something that she's remotely interested in. And she took that book and she read it, I think, faster than I did. Um, and she just found something in there that really just spoke to her as well. And, and I think it's a combination of optimism. Um, it's a love letter to NASA. It's a love letter to science. It's a love letter to, you know, stick to um, And, you know, I, I just, I, I think it's a really just fantastic. Yeah, we're all very excited. <laughs> <clears throat> all right, let's switch gears a little bit here. So Kevin, there's hundreds of billions of solar systems in the Milky Way. Correct. Roughly? Roughly? There's a lot. There's a lot. Mm -hmm. And there's a hundred billion, give or take a billion or two, galaxies in the universe. It's in that range. Okay. Do you think maybe there's another planet out there that has life on it? Well, the, the Kepler spacecraft and, and JWST uh, will do uh, a, a nice job. Well, the Kepler spacecraft has already discovered um, uh, many of these planets that, uh, that have given us some confidence that Earth-like planets do exist uh, out there beyond our sun. And those worlds are fantastic. It's a little frustrating, though, because we don't yet have warp drive. So once we <laughs> find an Earth-like planet, it's gonna take us a long time to get there. And in the meantime, I hope that we can really push forward with our robotic exploration of these worlds that have liquid water today. Now, Europa has got two to three times the volume of all the liquid water that we have here on Earth. It's good old fashioned H2O. It's a little bit salty, you probably wouldn't wanna drink it. But it's there today and it's been there for the history of the solar system. And so this little geochemistry experiment that might have yielded biology is out there orbiting Jupiter waiting for us to explore it. And recently, NASA uh, gave the green light to a mission that was formerly known as Europa Clipper. Uh, it'll be renamed something soon. And that mission will, uh, will be fantastic for revealing lots of secrets about Europa. But that's just the beginning. We need to put things down on the surface, we need to melt through that ice, and we need to explore that ocean in great detail. And what's great about that is, as we develop those tools and technologies, we need to test them someplace. And my hope is that we can test them here on Earth and explore our own ocean and better understand the ocean that is so precious and necessary for life here on Earth. So it's a win-win when NASA decides to explore something and to dare mighty things. We'll learn more about our home planet, how to protect it, and we might find life elsewhere. By the way, Kevin uh, has made nine dives to the bottom of the ocean, just so you know. Uh, just curious uh, what you were just talking about, though. Where, where, where would you, what would be your first choice to go to uh, try out those, those landers and uh, the drilling equipment and whatnot? Would it be just, you know, Northern Cali or? or no, we we'd going? go down to Antarctica to uh, Lake Vostok and some of the lakes that are underneath the Antarctic ice sheet. Nice. Yeah. That would be fun. Can I come? Yeah. <laughs> we can get funding. Okay. <laughs> Um, okay, so let's talk about exoplanets and uh, the James Webb Telescope, shall we, Amber? Let's do it. Um, so while we've discovered many extrasolar planet systems and exoplanets, we have yet to confirm a true Earth-like planet. So what's the future for NASA in the search for life outside our solar system? What are these discoveries teaching us? Well, I think it's really important to recognize 
just how far NASA missions have taken us in this sort of search for life. And um, I mean, what, as an astronomer, one of the things I love most about my job is that astronomy sort of gets to the heart of our big questions. You know, they're not just big questions for scientists, they're big questions for humanity. You know, where do we come from and how do we get here? And then the one we're talking about today, are we alone? And those are questions that people have been asking forever. And I think that's one of the, the cool things about, about being a scientist. And NASA's Kepler telescope has completely revolutionized our understanding of planetary systems. Uh, you know, when I was a kid, we knew of nine planets, the ones in our own solar system. Didn't know of any others. And in just my lifetime, uh, you know, now we know that planets are everywhere. There are probably more planets in our galaxy than there are stars. So if you go outside at night, point up at a star, it probably has a planet around it, right? That's paradigm shifting. We didn't know that uh, even just 15 years ago. So the fact that this, you know, relatively small telescope Kepler has changed the way we think about planets is amazing. And it really it speaks to the amazing things that, that NASA missions uh, do. So, so, I'm sorry, let me interrupt you just real quick, because yeah. what, what's the count at right now, by the way, of all the, all the planets? So there are just over 4,000 candidates um, and a little over 1,000. We just surpassed 1,000 planets confirmed this year. Wow. Um, yeah, it's amazing. Um, and about, I think we're at about, about a dozen of those that are um, in the habitable, habitable zone, zone. Uh, potentially Earth-like planets. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's remarkable what Kepler has done. Uh, so, and that's also, all of those planets that Kepler has found are, is in a relatively small part of the sky. So Kepler just stares at one small part of the sky to find these exoplanets. And so by you know, imagining what else is out there in the parts of the sky that Kepler's not looking at, that's how we can kind of estimate uh, the fact that we, there are billions and billions of planets in our galaxy alone. And you've already mentioned, you know, in addition to our galaxy that has a couple hundred billion stars, there are a couple hundred billion other galaxies outside of our Milky Way that you know, certainly have planets too. So the universe is vast. So you're saying there's a chance. There's, <laughs> there is absolutely a chance. I think there's a really good chance. But thinking about the future, so the way Kepler finds exoplanets is it stares at these stars, it watches for a little dip of light, which means that a, pan a planet's passed in front of the star. And so by using Kepler, we're able to find planets that are out there and determine some very basic properties about them. Uh, but we can't learn a lot of detail about those planets. And so we're, we have a couple of missions at NASA coming up. One is called the TESS telescope. Um, and that's going to launch in 2017. And so what that's going to do is a similar thing. It's going to look for transiting exoplanets, but relatively nearby. Uh, so planets there are, are orbiting stars that are a lot brighter, and so they'll be a lot closer to us. So a lot of the planets we've discovered with Kepler are relatively far away within our own galaxy. Uh, and then, uh, of course, the James Webb Space Telescope, which launches in 2018, I believe is really the next huge step in our understanding of these exoplanets. Because what uh, JWST will be able to do uh, that Kepler is not able to do is to study in detail the atmospheres of these exoplanets, right? So when those planets cross in front of their star, Webb is going to take detailed spectra of the atmospheres of these exoplanets. And that is incredibly hard to do, really <laughs> hard to do, right? Because stars are huge and bright and planets are tiny and their atmospheres are really, really thin. Uh, but we are building this awesome technology to launch on these telescopes to be able to do this really, really hard science that will enable us to learn about these exoplanets and find uh, potentially planets that are capable of supporting life. So Webb will be able to, for example, detect water vapor in exoplanet atmospheres, right? So we could easily find a water world with JWST. Wow. I'm just going to go off book for a second here, Kev. I want to ask you, uh, you, you and Amber both, all, all four of you really, uh, have you guys seen the, the pictures of Ceres, the, the dwarf planet? Yeah. Uh, what, what, what are our opinions on the uh, tiny little reflective spots on it? <laughs> I'm just curious. Go ahead, Amber. You can get started <laughs> off. 
Um, I have no idea. Uh, probably some type of ice. I don't know. Planetary scientist, let him tell you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll have to wait until the data comes back, uh, so I don't have to speculate, but um, stay tuned. I, I think it's potentially some, some salt evaporite uh, deposits uh, upwelled from, from below, but uh, it's too early to tell. But the Dawn spacecraft will, will give us a lot more data. It's going it's to get closer, right? It's going to get closer shots, or is um, that as close as it's going to get? It, it's about as close as it's going to get. I think it gets a, a little bit closer uh, later this summer. Okay. Um, but, you know, Ceres is, is a very interesting object in that once upon a time, it likely did have an ocean beneath uh, its, its outer shell. And so even if Ceres doesn't have an ocean today, it's still a very interesting world in terms of having water at some point in its past. Whether or not it had water long enough to give rise to life, whether or not it had the right chemistry, the mixture of water and rocks that would be needed for life to originate, that's an open question. But it's a, it's a fascinating world, and we're, we're, uh, what that big old pyramid is and what those bright spots are, I don't know, I'll, I'll, I'll let these guys speculate. I don't know. Go ahead, speculate away. Uh, I'm gonna go for definitive proof of an ancient hyperintelligent <laughs> alien civilization. <laughs> That's what I was looking for, baby. <laughs> yeah. I, I suffer no uh, professional penalty if I'm wrong. <laughs> Adam, thoughts? No, I pass. I, I, can't, okay. I can't follow up on that one. Okay. I, w I will just say that they did put a, a, a picture of Vegas from the International Space Station, which would have been a little too close to compare, but they did put it up next to it, and it did look very similar, so they were thinking maybe there was some gambling going on down there. <laughs> Um, okay, so we're on to our last little section here. How are we doing on our time? We're good. So, uh, two words, guys. Leonard Nimoy. <laughs> or as he was better known as Mr. Spock. An alien from the planet Vulcan. Uh, I just want to switch gears a little bit and talk about your dad and his life, his legacy, uh, how he was such an inspiration to so many people. Um, why don't you, uh, you know, he, I mean, he's been an icon for generations. Uh, people that weren't even born when Star Trek was on TV. And, uh, you know, that, that's something that continues to resonate so intensely for so many people. Um, obviously, his loss was a loss for the world, and uh, I was just curious, what, what about Spock do you think touched such curiosity you know, for his character? Why did he become an icon in, in our pop culture? It's kind of a long question, but. <laughs> That's a tough one. Uh, it's, it's interesting to me that after my dad passed away, there had been so much um, outpouring of emotion about, you know, oddly enough, about a man who tried to wrestle with his emotions, um, about the loss of Spock and what he had meant to so many people. And, uh, the, and, and for a number of reasons, which, and, which I can kind of talk a little bit about. The other thing that was kind of interesting I want to mention now is that not only were people uh, kind of grieving for the loss of this pop culture icon, but uh, there were a number of people who expressed their, their grief about losing Leonard Nimoy, the artist, as well. Um, that the two have become so entwined uh, with one another. And, um, and, I, and I've discovered, interestingly enough, it was kind of a surprise to me that, that a part of the longevity of Spock was the various things that people were, that resonated with different people throughout all of society, including scientists. Uh, but another factor that I didn't really quite understand was that people generally like Leonard Nimoy uh, as an artist, as a humanitarian, and, um, and that, in that he resonated uh, with a number of people across the planet. And, and the, you know, the kind of the symbiotic relationship between the two kept them both going, interestingly enough. I didn't really fully understand this because I thought it was going to just be a big, you know, the whole thing was going to be Spock, 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 but it was, there was a lot of Leonard, a lot of love for Leonard in there, which was very surprising and, you know, heartwarming to me, frankly. Um, and the rest of the family during the grieving process. But the, the thing about Spock that's so interesting is that there's so many different segments of society that have claimed him as 
their own, you know, and certainly the science community uh, repeatedly has come out in support of Spock as kind of, you know, an iconic, iconic image for them or as an ideal uh, for scientists, scientific study, uh, in large part because he was logical. He, um, he was the cool head, you know, on the bridge of the Enterprise. He was not the mad scientist in, you know, in some laboratory basement somewhere on the Enterprise. He was right there with the rest of the crew. And, um, you know, the, and the other thing that was interesting to me is that Spock was also in a command position. I mean, he's the first officer. When Kirk is on the planet, the scientist takes over the ship. And I'm sure most scientists just love that, you know. <laughs> That's the way it should be. <laughs> um, so that really, you know, resonated with the science community uh, and that he was cool, you know, that the, the, the nerd, the geek could be the outsider, uh, could be somebody who was cool and logical and thoughtful and interesting to obviously to look at. Um, there was a lot, you know, in terms of the other way of looking at this is kind of what I, which I really want to talk about very briefly, but it's important to cover is that, you know, this idea of Spock resonating with Leonard, you see the, the whole idea of bringing life to the character that my dad would use as, a, as his method was to bring something of his own personal life uh, to each of the characters that he was uh, tr creating or trying to give life to. My dad reminded me not long before he died that Spock was the only alien on the, on the crew of the Enterprise, on the, on the bridge, on the core crew of the Enterprise. He is the only alien. And that as such, his uh, objective, that his issue was how to integrate himself into the human society of his colleagues on that ship. How to give the best that he had to give. Uh, how to use his scientific knowledge that he had to offer for the benefit of his shipmates and his crew. And, and that was sort of you know, his overall objective, to stay a part of the group, a part of the team. This happened to be the exact same issue that my father was confronted with as a young man growing up in the West End of Boston. He was the son of Russian immigrant parents living in a heavy immigrant neighborhood in the West End. It was, uh, it was Irish and Italian Catholics and Russian and uh, European Jews. Very heavy immigrant environment. That, and, his, and the whole issue for his life was how to be able to transcend that and give the best that he had to give to society as a whole. So it was his ability to bring his own personal experience into the life of Spock, which enabled him to create this incredibly complex and dynamic inner life, inner life for Mr. Spock, because there's not, you know, there's not a bunch of emotion. There's not a whole lot of dialogue for Spock. He's very introspective, yet when he raises his eyebrow, you know that he's thinking something. He's commenting on something. There's something going on internally for him. So being the outsider has also resonated with people um, trying to integrate with the whole of the group has resonated with people. Being a minority on that crew has resonated with people. And the other thing that's been very interesting in the research I've been doing for this film, For the Love of Spock, is that very early on, within the first month of Star Trek airing, it became very apparent that Spock was very much loved by the female fan base. <laughs> That by the time they aired the Naked Time, in which he had that scene with with you know Nurse Chapel and in uh, you know uh, sick bay, and she expressed her love for him, th that unleashed this this incredible uh, letter writing campaign of of women fans out there who wanted to echo that and make sure that they knew that Spock was very much loved, not only by Nurse Chapel. So uh, this whole idea of being unattainable, and in fact, there was an article written by uh, Isaac Asimov at for TV Guide entitled Spock is Dreamy, which was, a, <laughs> which was a title that his daughter came up with, this whole idea, because he is a scientist. You know, he said that he was an open book. He just loved women, and, and they didn't show that much interest for him. But to be a scientist who was not quite attainable was something else that was a challenge to women and was also resonating with that whole other segment of society. So all these things, all, there was so, so much of Spock that people could relate to on so many different levels. And, and then we had the syndication market which kept Star Trek alive, yes. <laughs> five nights a week, you know, five o'clock, marathons on the weekends during the 70s when I was in college, everybody was in the, in the TV room watching Star Trek. That has kept him alive. And, and then we have the, the movie franchise which has kept Spock and the Enterprise and Star Trek in, in the franchise alive. 
and then we have the internet. We have, you know, and we have pop, you know, culture and pop art. We see the image of Spock just keeps turning up everywhere in the most unexpected places, on TV shows, in movies, in art. And it's just, it's so interesting that, that all he was trying to do was create an interesting and dynamic character. He never set out to create this pop culture icon, but the end result is what we've come to know and love as Mr. Spock. That's great. I am curious. <clears throat> we were talking to back there about this a little bit, but did, did he always have an interest in, in space exploration? I mean, did you guys you know, sit around the dinner table and, and talk about the Apollo program, or wh how'd that work out? That would be logical, <laughs> but it, that is not what went down. It's so interesting that, you know, in the 60s, there's this, this space, space race to the moon, you know, because of Sputnik. We, we have, you know, all this launching of all these, uh, you know, of, um, uh, of these probes that are going out, of the telecommunication satellites, of navigation satellites, of space exploration satellites, it's all in the 60s. And then we have the manned space program, you know, uh, we have the Gemini program, we have the Apollo program, all space exploration going on while Star Trek starts airing in September of 66. But it was not something that we necessarily discussed, in large part because we never had family dinners and discussed anything, because as you know, these, these shows are so incredibly difficult to make. My dad was on a soundstage for 12 to 14 hours a day for three years. We never even saw him, really. Um, and, and, and science was not necessarily his forte. Remember, you know, although my father had a very fine mind, he was not really, didn't have that much formal education, which was something that dismayed his parents, I can tell you right away, because uh, they, they were, you know, were looking for doctors and lawyers. And my Uncle Mel, whose oldest son is in the audience tonight, my cousin Paul, hey Paul. My uncle Mel went to MIT and became a chemical engineer for Johnson & Johnson for 30 years. That's what my grandparents wanted, but that is not what they got. And, and, we're, and we're blessed by that difference, as my dad would say. So um, that was, you know, although the science, you know, space exploration was of interest to me, that was not something that we were discussing at that time, and it was not necessarily something that was of interest, you know, to him initially. But since he's had so much interaction with the scientific community, he's constantly being shown research by all these scientists who he has inspired to do the research, and they want commentary from him about their research. <laughs> and he, he would always use his stock phrase, which was, you're on the right track. <laughs> Great. Um, all right, well, Adam, I think it's time for you to uh, show us some footage. If you'd like to see it, we have a very short sizzle reel that we put together. Yes, now. This was, this was put together early on in the early stages of, of making this film, which we're still in the process of making, which is expanded to include not only, I got a disclaimer, it's not just Spock, it is gonna be more about the life of Leonard Nimoy, his process, his artistic career, his, uh, his humanitarianism, really. Um, but this little reel that we put together very early on to try to generate interest in the project is very Spock-centric, so let's just take a look. Thank you. As you may or, not have, may or may not have heard, that was the current Spock, Zachary Quinto, narrating that trailer there. And he narrates the, the whole film? He will be narrating the whole film, yeah. yeah. Luckily Great. for me, yeah. Uh, so we're pretty much out of time. Uh, I guess, I don't know, what's the over-under on uh, when we come up with a teleportation device? <laughs> Kevin, we have, we have a little Amber. more to do, yeah. Well, I, I don't know about the teleportation device, but it, it is really important to appreciate the timing of when you're alive, um, be it exoplanets, be it the search for life on Mars, be it the exploration of these ocean worlds out there in our solar system. Appreciate that for the first time in the history of humanity, we have the tools and technology. We know how to do the experiments to go out there and see whether or not life does exist beyond Earth. Never before has humanity been able to do this kind of exploration. And so, you know, in this life cycle of science and science fiction, it's important that we help buoy each other because we can do it, 
but we need the public to be engaged in it. We need the public to be excited about it. We need schools to be teaching it. We need the next generation to be coming up through making the films, developing the instruments, building the missions, so that we can actually make these great discoveries, be they within our solar system or beyond. Math, science, math, science. <laughs> Encourage the kids to go that direction. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming out. This has been a blast and a dream come true for me. Thanks, our panel. Amber Strawn, Kevin Hand, Adam Nimoy, Aditya Sood. Thanks, guys. This is a blast. Thank you. All right.